So when I was in school, I took this class called Systematics of Theology. And it's just this very, um, it's this very detailed, very intense study of Christianity. And it takes Christianity and it divides it into these categories, and they're called loci, L-O-C-I. Because, you know, when a theologian or a preacher can say something simply, instead, they come up with a brand new word that nobody's ever heard before, right? So when you get to seminary, it's even worse. So the word is loci, and it's, it's nine different categories or nine different, nine different parts of Christianity uh, that are examined and discussed. The whole reason this thing started was centuries ago was because people were arguing about things. And so this whole idea of these loci, these nine loci, is supposedly a framework for these arguments. And since I graduated from school in 2018, they've actually added one more. And so, right, because we didn't have enough to fight about, so let's, get, let's pick one more thing. So anyway, um, so they're labeled, each of them are labeled, and, and it's the study of, and you guys know the, most, most of you know this word, the study of is um, captured in the Latin root ology. All right, so if you're studying about the character of God, you're studying theology. Theo is God, ology is the study of. So the study of God is theology, right? So if you're studying about Christ, you're studying Christology. And, and just whatever the study of and fill in the blank, whether you're studying about salvation, whether you're studying about sin, if you're studying about the church, and, and on and on. And so the new one that they came up is the study of angels, which is angelology. Sounds like the title of a good country western song, doesn't it? All right, so that's my systematics class. And so the question, though, they're going to ask me in March is, Mary, what is your theology of Scripture? What is your personal belief about things? I mean, they could have asked me, what is your theology of worship? How do you think God wants us to worship? Or what do you believe worship should be, right? So you can have your own individual theology. You don't have to go to seminary. You don't have to go to school. You don't have to do any of those things. Each of you has a belief about how worship should be conducted, about tithing, about offerings, all of those things you can have your own personal beliefs about. But they're going to ask me, what do I believe about what God says in the Scripture? And I, I've got to be prepared for that. I've got to be able to answer some, answer some questions they're going to answer me, right? And the thing I have to do to answer questions about Scripture is know some Scripture. Now, if they ask me 30 years ago, Man, I could just spit that stuff out just like that. When I was 16, I was in, a, I was in this thing called the Bible, Bible Memory Association, right? It's Bible memory verses. Every week there were 10 or 12 or 15 verses, and I had to memorize them, and I had a coach, and I had to go and just say them to my coach, and then i get a little check mark in my book. And then in the summer, we would all go to camp, and we would have a contest to see which, which kid, which teenager, could memorize, had memorized the most verses and could then say them all together. I didn't ever win that one. But, <laughs> but I tried. I gave it my best, Max. I finished in the top three one time. Yes, I can't remember any of that mess now. <laughs> Y'all are so funny. Yeah, so, so I got to know some scripture, right, to talk to these to these folks on the Board of Ordained Ministry about my theology of Scripture. What do I think that God says about God's Word? And what do I think other people should know about the Word of God? And guess what? I'm, re I'm looking forward to answering this question. I'm kind of rubbing my hands and drooling a little. I'm ready. Because I spent my whole life being condemned by Scripture. I grew up in a faith tradition where... They wouldn't let me stand in front of you and preach to you because I'm female. 
I grew up in a faith tradition that at one point asked my family to leave the church because they found out my mother had been divorced. Right? So I have grown up in a faith tradition where the scripture has done nothing but stand on my throat and hold me down. And so you bet I'm ready to answer that question. I've got a theology of scripture. And guess what? I'm going to share it with you today. So we're going to pretend that we're in the interview room and they have just asked me, Mary, what is your theology of scripture? And the first thing I'm going to say to them is that I believe that scripture is sacred. The thing that makes it sacred for me is it's the only source we have that tells us about Jesus Christ. You can't go and pick up a history book written by a Roman historian or a Jewish historian or anyone that talks about the life and the ministry of Jesus Christ. It's not in the library, folks. It's right here. It's in these it's in these pages. And so this is sacred to me. Now there's a very brief reference from a Jewish historian named Josephus who talked about a man named Christ who had followers who was crucified by the Roman government. That's about all it says. Doesn't talk about miracles, doesn't talk about the cross, doesn't talk about resurrection. There's another um, a Roman historian. Let's see, what was his name? Tacitus. He wrote also, when Jesus was crucified, that was recorded in Roman history. Nothing else in there about being the Son of God, about, about healing people, nothing about what he said or what he did. Just that he had some followers. The Roman government declared them to be against the law or to be outlaws, and that Jesus was consequently crucified. Other than that, folks, this is it. This is all we've got. And so that's sacred to me. This is the first place I learned about grace, reading these scripture. This is the place where I learned about mercy. It's the place where I've learned, especially since I came here, Max, that God is love. And that's the end of that sentence. There's no God is love if you are something. There's no God is love when something happens. It's just God is love. The second thing I believe about Scripture is that the stories in this book were written thousands of years ago by people who were used to having their history recorded in an oral tradition. So the stories of their lives were passed from generation to generation to generation. Now, you all know what happens when you're telling a good story, right? What happens? Especially if Keith's telling it. There's going to be some, there's going to be a little embellishment here and there, right? He's going to add some details. If Brian's telling you a story, let me just tell you about being from Wisconsin. If Brian's telling you a story, it's probably going to be mostly true. <laughs> But Brian's going to add a few things to also make it funny, right? He tell, Brian tells a great story, but he adds a little bit. He embellishes a little bit. Sorry, Brian, I've told you, I've told you a secret. Yeah, because it makes it a good story, right? So the people of Israel, the Hebrews, recorded their history by sharing with it with each other orally. And there were, there were men... I, I guess there might have been women too, but you know, this was also a patriarchal society. So there were men who would gather large groups and they would teach each other. And that's where the, the Old Testament especially, but that's where the scriptures come from, is from this people who have an oral tradition of their lives. The other thing I believe about scripture is that this book is filled with some great literature some great epic poems. 
also some epic exaggerations. I believe there's prose and poetry in this book. There's some history in here. All those bagats, you remember? Oh, yeah, that's history. They were writing down their genealogy in much the same way your grandmother probably wrote down your genealogy in the family Bible. There's a lot of metaphor in here. There are a lot of things that, especially when you consider the parables, there, there, there's symbolism used. There's some great, great literary tools in here. But the book itself is not literal. The passages in the book are not literal. It's designed to tell us the story of the people of God. I, I don't, and this may get, they may stop me right here and say, okay, Mary, thank you for your time. There's the door. I believe there are a lot of things in here that really happened. But I don't believe everything that's in here is, is literal. I don't think you can read it and just take it for what it says. I think you have to have a relationship with, this, with these words. You have to re have a relationship with God. The subject of these writings, you have, it, it's got to go further than just reading it. You guys know I read Father Richard Rohr a lot. In a few weeks, he'd written this, this little article about, about the Hebrew people and about the children of Israel. And he says that we should consider the fact that these stories about the children of Israel, well, that they're really just a metaphor for our lives and for our relationship with God. Because what do we know about those, those folks, those children of Israel, right? They were always messing up, <laughs> always messing up. God would do something wonderful for them, and they would serve God for a little while, and then they'd find something else to do, get into some kind of trouble somewhere. They built a golden calf, right? They, they poured, they made a, an, an idol out of gold, called that their God for a while. They had all these festivals and all of these, um, these, these sacred times in their, in, in, their, in their rituals and in their traditions. And sometimes they would worship their traditions and their rituals and forget that they're supposed to be worshiping Jehovah. And so what, what do we do now? We're just like them. We are. And so when Rohr says, we've got to consider the fact that the Old Testament, a lot of it is just a metaphor for our lives, I, I think that's a perfect way to look at it. One of my strongest beliefs about Scripture, about what we read here, in this book called the Holy Bible, is that every bit of it has to be measured against what the Gospels of Jesus Christ teach us. What do the Gospels say? What does the Gospel say about the nature of Jesus Christ? We're loved. We stood right here Wednesday night, Ash Wednesday. I anointed your head with with. Ashes, it, was, it wasn't mud, it wasn't dirt, it was ashes. It was ashes. It was actually off the pile of firewood at my house because we don't know what happened to the palm leaves from last year. But this year, we're going to know where they are. So I burned some firewood in the afternoon. I talked to God while it was burning. I enjoyed that fire. I scooped up those ashes. I mixed them with some olive oil. I prayed over them. And I anointed your head with oil. And what did I say to you? You are loved. You are forgiven. That's the nature of Christ. And so everything in this book has to be measured against those things. We are loved. And we are forgiven. The pastor at Keller United Methodist Church says that the word of God, the things written in here, the words about God need to point you to the Word, the capital W, to the Word made flesh, 
to Jesus Christ. That what you read and hear should point you to Jesus Christ. And if it doesn't point you towards Jesus Christ, then you need to delve into it and you need to find out why. You need to know the history and the context behind it. And Max, <laughs> Max preaches this every single week. He tells you that if what is written in here about God does not correlate with what we know of Jesus Christ, then you're not getting a true picture of who God is. And so I want you to think about that when you hear all these things from the, t from the TV, all these news stories, all this whole idea that God's whole intention is to punish us for our sins. Because that's not what Christ said to us, is it? And this whole idea that God brings down famine and curses on humanity. That's not what Christ says, is it? And so whatever you hear from a pulpit or from a news show or from a human being or from a politician, God forbid, because really they haven't read any of it, I don't think. But whatever you hear, please, in your heart, measure it against what you know to be true about the nature of Jesus Christ. John Wesley describes Scripture as the supreme authority on our faith, and I believe that. I believe if we want to know about Christianity, if we want to know about who we are and where we came from and why we believe what we believe, uh, folks, it's in this book. But what you need to know is that there are 15,000 different translations of the, of, this, of the Hebrew Scripture and the Gospels. 15,000 different times that it has been interpreted. And I believe it's inspired interpretation. I do. I do. I'm not saying that God just sat back and let us write whatever we wanted to write. I, I, I'm not saying that at all. But what I am saying to you is that when you write something down 15,000 times, you might get a word in the wrong place here or there. Or you might forget to include that the context of the verse that says, women be silent in the church, <laughs> is not the same context we live in today. And it is the primary source of my faith. Without that book, I don't know anything about Jesus Christ. I don't know anything about the people of Israel. I haven't read a miracle of feeding 10 or 20,000 people. I don't know about Jesus laying his hands on folks and healing them. Without this book, but it can only be trusted, this book, when you read it through the lens of reason experience, and tradition. And those are Wesleyan terms. Scripture is the sole authority, but I have to use my brain too. I have to use my intellect, my reason to understand it. I have to use my experience with it and with the living God to actually understand it. And I need to be a part of a faith tradition. I need to know what other people have said about what's written here, what other people believe, how other people experience it. And so you can't just take it on its own. It can only be trusted when it's read through the lens of reason, experience, and tradition. And finally, I, I believe this, and this could be the thing that gets me uninvited from ordination. But this is what I read, uh, what I believe. And I even wrote this, I remember, in a paper when I was in school. I believe there are an exponential number of ideas about the nature and the sovereignty of God and that those ideas have been established by scholars from all walks of life. I also believe that there are the same numbers, same number of ideas and opinions about Scripture and going to seminary, thank goodness, gave me the skill set to figure out which ones are true or which ones hold truth 
And which ones really just hold hot air? But here's the thing, folks, I believe with all my heart, that without a revelatory experience with the living God, that nothing spoken or written about Christ can be trusted. And if what you're reading doesn't include all of God's creation, then it isn't God's truth. And so here, briefly, is what I'm going to say to those folks in that interview. Scripture is sacred to me because it's the first place I ever read about God's grace. Scripture is sacred to me because there are passages of comfort and compassion that are more beautifully written in this book than in all of literature. Matthew 6.33 says, Come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. John 14. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. If my, my father's house, there are many mansions. And if that weren't so, I would have told you it wasn't so. And if I'm going there, I'm preparing a place for you that where I go, you can also be. And many of us, many of us find comfort in that verse because those we have loved have gone on to be with Jesus Christ. And so we are grateful that Christ, to comfort us, told us, don't let your heart be troubled. I'm coming back to get you. And I'm taking you with me. As I think about, as I think about Anna, as I think about my daughter-in-law this morning, fighting for her life, I know that Anna walks through the valley of the shadow of death and she's not afraid because God is with her. And God's rod and God's staff, God's love and God's discipline, they comfort her. And God is preparing a place for her in the presence of her difficulties of life. And God has anointed her head with oil and her cup runs over and I know that. Without this book, I would have never read the 23rd Psalm. Folks, we're in a relationship with a living God. And the stories of that God, the stories of our God are written in this book. And it is also alive. And these scriptures are alive. Now, there's things in here that it makes me sick to read them. It makes me physically ill. Things that break my heart. Things that I look at them and I read them and I think, what are you people doing writing that kind of stuff down? What are you thinking? And there's some stuff in here, I, I don't get it at all. I, I just don't get it. But here's the thing I know and here's what I will say at that interview. That really my theology of Scripture is I don't know where I'd be without it. Pray with me, please. Gracious God, you've, you've inspired this word that we read about you. And we can see you and your love and your, your presence with us woven in and out of all of these stories, these poems, these metaphors. We can find you, Lord, in these pages, and we can find what happens to people when you are not allowed into their lives. And so, God, for the things in this book that condemn us, that's, that, that, that exclude us, that separate us from each other, God, we know that your truth is not in those pages and in those stories. God, for the things that call us to love, that call us to forgiveness, they call us to the foot of the cross. God, we know, we know that you are in those pages and that that is your truth. And so, God, we praise you now because we are loved and we are forgiven. And all the people said, 
Amen.